So welcome to today's lecture recap. And so last time we were talking about the idea of thermal conductivity and the transfer of heat through a material via a heat current. And we understood a quantitative relationship between this heat current and various properties of the system. So just to remind you what the heat current is, is <clears throat> that is the amount of energy per unit time being transferred through the system through a particular cross-sectional area. So I could look at this area here or some of the other area over here. And we understood that if we are in a steady state situation where the temperatures of various parts of an object are not changing, then the heat current has to be the same through all of the parts of the system. Otherwise, heat would be building up in some region and the temperature would be increasing. So we had a quantitative formula which related this heat current to various other things. So what is important to have a heat flow is that you have a temperature difference from one side to the other. And more specifically, what's important is the temperature gradient. So the temperature of the higher side minus the side divided by that distance there. In calculus, we would replace that. In, so we could replace that by the derivative of the temperature with respect to the position. That's really the quantity that is important here. If we look at this area here, what's important for determining the heat flow through that little area is how quickly the temperature is changing um, at that point. But in this simple situation, we assume that temperature is changing uniformly from one side to the other, and then we could just replace the derivative with a difference in temperature divided by the divided by the length. Okay. The other thing that's important would be the area, the cross-sectional area. If we have a situation with twice the cross-sectional area, we put two bricks between these two different objects, then we're going to have twice the heat current. And finally, you have a proportionality constant. This is a basic property of the material. We call it the thermal conductivity, and it's something that we could just measure or look up in a table in order to, in order to determine precisely what the heat current is going to be given these other quantities. Okay. And we saw last time that there's quite a variation in the possible thermal conductivities. And so for a good metal, like uh, a good conductor, like aluminum or copper, then the conductivity might be thousands of times higher than for a poor conductor like styrofoam. So I want to think about that formula and apply it to this situation. So sometimes when we think about thermal conductivity, we are aiming to use materials to achieve a high conductivity. So for example, when you're building a pot for cooking, you want the material of the pot to have a very high conductivity so that when you put it on the stove and you turn on the burner, then the heat is able to flow very quickly through the pot into your food. On the other hand, in a lot of applications, we want the opposite. We want to have a situation where the conductivity is low. We want to prevent heat flow. So for example, when you're insulating a home, you want a layer on your walls where the heat flow from the inside to the outside is as small as possible. And that means that when you're heating your home with your furnace, you have to build, you have to burn uh, as little fuel as possible. And so here's a, here's an application thinking about um, the effectiveness of making the wall, making the insulation thicker or choosing the material for your insulation. So think about this for a few minutes and uh, come up with an answer, pause your video, and then we'll talk about that. Okay, so let me discuss this question, making reference to our conductivity formula. So the idea here is that we have, we have a house and the temperature inside is room temperature, the temperature outside is zero. And we've got some heat current that's flowing through all these different walls. And so 
what we would say in this kind of situation is that the total heat current flowing through the walls would be, say, a sum of the heat current through each of the walls and the floor and the ceiling. So there should probably be six different H's here if, if we're talking about a three-dimensional house. Um, so H1 plus H2 plus dot, dot, dot. Okay. Now, for each of these ones, we're going to have our basic equation that H is equal to Ka Th minus Tc over L. And in this case, looks like the in each situation, the thickness of the walls is the same for all of the walls, and the conductivity is the same for all of the walls, and the temperature difference is the same for all of the walls. And so we could actually treat everything together. And when we're just when we're talking about the area here in this formula, we could just take the entire area of all the walls and the ceiling and the floor together. And so we, we basically just need to think about that one formula and compare the situation on the left with the situation on the right. So what's different in the two situations is basically just the conductivity and the thickness. Okay. And so what we notice is in the situation on the right, we have a material that has half of the conductivity, so a K is half, and we have that same material has twice the thickness, so L is double, and so if we apply it in our formula, what we find is that H is one quarter in the situation on the right. So the heat flow through the walls in the situation on the right is one quarter of the heat flow through the walls in the situation on the left. Okay, the, I should say the heat current joules per second is one quarter on the right as it is on the left. Now the question asks about how much fuel is needed to be burned by the furnace. So we have to think a little bit more about how that is related to this heat flow through the walls. But it's fairly clear if we're in some sort of steady state situation where the temperature inside the house is not changing, that means the heat current through the walls must be equal to the amount of heat, the amount of energy per time that we are supplying in, that we're adding into the house from the furnace through burning this fuel. Okay, so we have that H walls equals H furnace. And so if the heat current through the walls on the right-hand situation is one quarter as compared to the left situation, then the heat coming out of the furnace must also be one quarter in order to maintain this steady state. Okay, and so then we can conclude that the amount of fuel needed to be burned by the furnace in the second house is a quarter as much as the amount of heat burned in the first house. Okay. So it's, you know, it's clearly um, very effective then to choose materials that have a low conductivity and then also layer your insulation on the, on the walls of your house. If you add a layer, if you double that layer, then you're going to have um, half of the amount of heat that you need to burn in your furnace. So that's uh, so that's a very good idea. Similarly, if, if if you're wearing clothes, if you have a shirt on, if you put another shirt on on top of that, then you know your your body is going you're going to be losing heat at half the rate um, through that through that shirt as compared to before. So when we're talking about insulation, so we've seen that the thickness is important and the thermal conductivity is important. And it's, it's kind of this combination that comes into the heat flow equation. And so actually it's very convenient to define that combination as something that we call the thermal resistance. Okay, so this is, this is going to be higher for a good insulator and lower for a poor insulator or a good conductor. And this quantity you can think of as being a measure of the effectiveness of an insulation layer. Okay, so when you go to the, if you go to a hardware store, um, if you go to Home Depot, for example, and you go to the section 
where they sell insulation for your home, then what you'll see actually is an R value for various kinds of insulation layers that you can buy. Uh, so you might see a particular uh, fiberglass insulation is R8 or R12. And what that number is, it's actually just this value, R, the thickness divided by the thermal conductivity, except it's usually in weird units. So usually when you see an R value at the hardware store, it's measured for historical reasons in units of foot squared degrees Fahrenheit hours per British thermal unit. Um, but that's just, you could just convert, if, if you want SI units, you would just multiply that number by a particular conversion factor. Okay. So the idea here is that if you're insulating a, a, a home or, or a, a container, then you would like to have as large an R value as possible. And you do that by making your, making your walls thicker or choosing a material with a smaller thermal conductivity. Okay. So the fact that it's called thermal resistance is not a coincidence. There's a very, very close analogy between this quantity and electrical resistance. And so I want to show you that the heat current formula that we've been talking about, if you express it in terms of this thermal resistance, it looks just like the Ohm's law that relates voltage, current, and resistance in electrical circuits. So here I've basically just rearranged our equation a little bit. I've brought the area term on the left-hand side, and I've expressed L over K as the R value, as the thermal resistance. And then we have an equation that says that the, the heat current per area, so per area of your wall, the heat current is equal to the temperature difference between the two sides divided by the thermal resistance. And this looks very much like Ohm's law, which says that the electrical current through a resistor is equal to the voltage difference between the two sides divided by the electrical resistance. Okay. So it's, it's a precise mathematical analogy. And this is actually very useful because we've learned, you probably know a lot about understanding resistors and in combinations, and you've done problems kind of predicting the current through a circuit given the various resistances. So let me give you an example of how this analogy can be useful. So suppose that we have a situation where we have multiple layers of insulation and we want to predict what is the total heat current through the two layers, given some temperature difference on the left side and on the right side. So that's analogous to a problem where we would have two resistors in series and we're given the resistances of the two. Okay. And in that case, you learned that we can define a total resistance of the combination of those two resistors just by adding up the two resistances in the circuit. And then we can find the total current by taking the voltage across the two sides and dividing by that total resistance. Um, so the same thing works here. You can just add up the two thermal resistances and that will give you a net thermal resistance of your insulation layer. And then you can just use the this formula here to figure out the current in terms of the temperature difference and that total resistance. Let me just give you a quick derivation of that. So of course we could just appeal to the analogy with resistances and then at some point someone probably proved to you why the resistances add up but we can actually just derive this here um, so let me let me just draw our situation so we have the two different walls two different thicknesses two different k values and we have these two temperatures on either side and so let's call the temperature between the layers t2 so we're going to need that in our derivation. So it's really quite simple. What we want to do is predict this, um, this heat flow H, which we understand must be the same through the left layer as the right layer in the steady state situation where you don't have any energy building up. And so we can first look at the layers individually 
So looking at that left layer, we can say that T3 minus T2, so I'm, I'm going to rearrange the equation from the previous slide to isolate the temperature difference on the left side. So T3 minus T2, um, that's going to be equal to the thermal resistance of the left layer, so R1, and then times this heat current divided by the area. Okay. Similarly, if I look at the second layer, then we would have T2 minus T1 is equal to the thermal resistance of the second layer times the heat current divided by the area. So I'm already using the fact that the two heat currents are the same. Okay. So now I simply add these two equations. So if I add the left-hand sides, what I get is T1. So we add, we get T1, or sorry, T3 minus T1. And then on the right-hand side, I get R1 plus R2 times H over A. And so as promised, the heat current per area flowing through the entire system is related to the temperature difference on either side by this net thermal resistance. So the proportionality constant is a sort of total thermal resistance, which is just the sum of those two thermal resistances. Okay. And so the easiest way, if someone gives you a multi-layer system, maybe there's eight different layers and they all have different thicknesses and different con con connectivities, then you would basically just need to add up the R values. You add up L over K for each layer, add them all up. That gives you a total R value for your insulation layer. And then you can just use it in our formula here to relate the net heat current through all of the layers to the temperature difference from one side to the other. And doing it that way, you never even have to worry about what are the intermediate temperatures between all of the layers. Okay. So that is a good thing to remember for more complicated problems and for real world situations where you might want to achieve a certain, uh, a certain amount of insulation by combining various layers. Okay, so that's just what we showed there. So that is basically all we have to say for now about thermal conductivity. And I want to move on to talking about a couple of other mechanisms by which heat can be transferred from a warmer material uh, to its surroundings. Okay. So usually when we're talking about thermal conductivity, that's conduction of heat through a solid. Other times you might have heat, uh, an object, and it might be in air or it might be in a fluid. And in those situations, you can have something like conduction. So you can have the molecules in the hot object bumping against the molecules in the fluid, and then those things move around randomly and bump into nearby molecules, and then heat can be transferred that way. But there's a difference when you have a liquid or a gas which is that in the liquid and the gas, you could also actually have the molecules of the fluid, which get heated up by your material, they can actually now move through the rest of the fluid. Okay, so they're not just constrained to vibrate around and bump into the nearby molecules. When you add some energy to the molecules in the fluid, they can now actually move through the rest of the fluid. And, and so that can be a more efficient mechanism of transferring energy away from your hot object. So that, that is called convection. And for convection, there's not a nice simple formula like our conductivity formula, or like the formulas we're going to see when we talk about radiation. Okay, and the reason is that fluid dynamics is a very complicated subject. Understanding the motions of all the molecules in a fluid um, is, is one of the most challenging problems in theoretical physics or in applied mathematics. There's a set of equations called the Navier-Stokes equations and, and they're just very difficult to solve, even using powerful computers. And so it's really, not, uh, it's really not a simple process of saying, if I have a hot object and I put it in some fluid, 
you know, exactly what's going to happen. When you get these chaotic motions of the molecules, and it's, it's, uh, it's quite challenging um, to understand. So people can do experiments and people can understand some things about how quickly things, objects lose heat due to convection. Uh, but again, there's not really a simple general rule that applies in all the situations. Um, so we're gonna move on um, to this third mechanism of heat transfer, where we can understand things quantitatively. And so this third mechanism is the radiation of energy through electromagnetic radiation. So we already talked about how warm objects, even at room temperature, are giving off electromagnetic radiation. We said that um, very hot objects have that electromagnetic radiation in the visible part of the spectrum. Cooler objects would have mostly infrared radiation. So what we want to do now is sort of quantify when you have a warm object, what types of radiation does it produce? How much of each of those types does it produce? And what's the total power coming off the object? So just to introduce this a little bit more, um, I want to talk about the physical under our physical understanding of what this electromagnetic radiation is. Uh, just just kind of as an aside, because it's like one of the one of the greatest moments in the history of physics or science um, was when when we understood what light actually is. So maybe you've heard this before, but I'm going to tell it again. Uh, the story involves James Clerk Maxwell, who was uh, a, a very well known physicist from the from the 1800s. And what Maxwell realized was that light was actually an electromagnetic phenomenon. So up until the time of Maxwell's work, these were two entirely separate subjects, the study of electricity and magnetism and the study of optics and light. And so, so what happened was that, you know, in the study of electricity and magnetism, people learned various laws. So they came up with Coulomb's law. They came up with the idea of the electric field that a charged particle will produce an electric field and that electric field will act on other charged particles. And similarly, they came up with the idea of a magnetic field that a magnet will produce a magnetic field and then that will produce forces on other magnets or on moving charges. So on top of those two things, there were a couple of more physical laws that had to do with electricity and magnetism in situations where things are changing with time. And so, so Faraday realized that if you have a changing magnetic field, then it actually produces an electric field. So if you spin a magnet around, um, that changing magnetic field would actually result in an electric field, even though you don't have any charges there. So that's, that's called Faraday's law. Maxwell realized a similar phenomenon where if you have a changing magnetic field, sorry, changing electric field, then that will give rise to a magnetic field. Okay. And then Maxwell kind of combined these two ideas, mathematically combining these two ideas. What he realized was that you can set up a situation where, where it's like a, a chain reaction, where if you start by producing an oscillating electric field, that will give rise to an oscillating magnetic field. And then in turn, that will produce more oscillating electric field, and that will produce more oscillating magnetic field. And so what can happen is you get these electric and magnetic fields that are oscillating and, and giving rise to other electric and magnetic fields. And this whole thing behaves as some kind of a propagating wave of oscillating electric and magnetic fields. And that can propagate through space even without any charges or magnets around. So this was a result of just analyzing the mathematics of the equations that people had come up with to describe electric and magnetic fields. And so upon further inspection, what he realized was that these equations predicted that these oscillating electric and magnetic fields always travel through space at a particular velocity. And the velocity was expressed in terms of the constant that appears in Coulomb's law, this parameter epsilon zero, and another constant that appears in, in the magnetic version of this, 
a parameter called mu zero. So the velocity was equal to one over the square root of epsilon zero times mu zero. Now, these were constants that could be measured by doing experiments looking at the forces between charges and the forces between magnets. And by using the measured values of those constants and plugging them into this formula that he derived for the velocity, he found that these electric and magnetic oscillations should travel through space at a velocity which is around 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Now, fairly recently, before that, people had actually gone out and measured the speed of light for the first time, and they'd also obtained a value of around 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And so Maxwell made this connection that maybe light, which up until then had no sort of fundamental understanding of what it was, maybe light is actually equal, it's actually the same thing as these propagating electric and magnetic waves that he was predicting through the equations of electromagnetism. So he made this connection and that was in 1864. And so at that point, two major fields of physics, the study of optics and the study of electromagnetism became unified. And it was realized that, that the light is really just an electromagnetic phenomenon. Okay. So that came along. So that understanding actually led then to a prediction of Maxwell. Um, so Maxwell predicted that even though when we look at visible light, we see certain ranges of wavelengths. Maxwell says, when I look at my mathematical equations for electromagnetism, I seem to be able to have waves that are not just in that allowed range of wavelengths that, of, of light that we see, but there seems to be the possibility of similar electromagnetic waves at all possible wavelengths. And so Maxwell was able to predict the existence of what we call infrared rays, so, which is like light with a wavelength longer than visible light, ultraviolet waves, rays, electromagnetic radiation with a wavelength that's shorter than visible light, and then all of these other possibilities that we now have names for. Okay. Um, so this, this was later verified. And so of course, now we know we have radio waves and microwaves and infrared and ultraviolet and X-rays and gamma rays. Okay, so that's just a bit of, of history, one of the great moments in physics. Now we want to understand what is it that is relevant for us in our study of thermal radiation. Okay. So what we said was that if you have a hot object or even a room temperature object, it's going to be producing some of these electromagnetic waves. And some of them are in, vis in the visible range. Um, a lot of them tend to be in the infrared range. Sometimes you have some ultraviolet. And what we care about is how much of each one would you have at a particular temperature? And if I change the temperature, how does, how does that distribution change? Okay. So what we wanna do is quantify that somehow. We wanna quantify how much energy of radiation is coming off of our object for different wavelengths. So this is a really nice picture of a piece of metal where different parts of the metal are different temperatures. And so what you see is that this very hot part, it looks more yellow. This part over here looks more red. And so if we focus on one part of the object, let's say this, this hot yellow looking part, um, one important thing is that it's not all light of one, excuse me, one particular wavelength. So it's not like it's all yellow light. Um, actually, there's a lot of infrared radiation. There's yellow light, there's orange light, there's red light. There might be a little bit of green. Um, and just the combination of those things to our eyes, it looks yellow. So in order to describe the radiation coming off of this object here, which you know, maybe it's 1500 degrees um, Celsius, then what we need to do is actually say, we'd actually need to provide something like a graph that says, for each possible wavelength, how much radiation is there at that wavelength? Okay. So that is the idea. That's what we call a spectrum graph. And so what, what we want to understand mathematically is that is for an object with a certain temperature, 
what does the spectrum graph look like? Okay, so let's be a little bit more precise about what information is contained in this spectrum graph. Okay. So the x-axis is the wavelength and the y-axis is something related to the power emitted, the energy per time emitted from our object, um, but it's the power just in a particular wave range of wavelength. Okay, so we say it's the power per nanometer. And, and so what can we do with this graph? Um, so the idea is that if you look at the graph and then you look at some specific range of wavelengths, say between 700 nanometers and 720 nanometers, so maybe that's what this range is, then the area under the graph in that little range tells you the total amount of power that's being emitted in that range of wavelengths. Okay, so this might be a particular band of wavelengths in the red light, in the visible red light spectrum. Um, and if I, if I then take the x-axis, so the 20 nanometers, and then I multiply it by the height on the graph, which is in units of watts per nanometer, so 20 nanometers times 400 watts per nanometer, um, that would give me then 8,000 watts. Okay, so, so I learned from this graph that in that narrow range of wavelengths, we have 8,000 watts of radiation coming off of this particular object. Okay. So I want to give you an example um, to think through. So sometimes we are interested in actually just the total amount of power coming off an object. And so this is like a fictitious graph that could possibly describe the spectrum of radiation coming from a light bulb. And I'm asking you, uh, the total power of the bulb is closest to, and now just, um, just uh, yeah, to understand which one of these options is it closest to. So pause the video, think about that for a moment, and then we'll answer. Okay, so, so this one's fairly simple. What we have is a graph that happens to look like a triangle. And so that's convenient because what we learned was that for each range of wavelengths, the amount of radiation coming off is, is going to be just the height of the graph um, times the thickness. And so if we want to know the total power coming off of the graph, um, what we need to do is figure out the total area under this, under this um, curve. And it's a triangle. And so we just use our formula from grade five, um, grade five elementary school math, that the area of the triangle is half the area of the base times the height. And so we can take 800, minus 400, so that's 400, uh, take half of that 200 nanometers, and then multiply by the height, which is 0 0.5. And so in the end, it's 100, it's gonna be 100 watts. Um, and so, so that's the answer in this case, just looking at the area under the curve, it's 100 watts. If we wanted to know the total amount of power at wavelengths longer than 600 nanometers, then we would just take the area of this part. And so that would be also some triangle. And, um, and so the, the graph has very detailed information about whatever question we would want to know. Okay. So next time, what we're going to try to understand is specifically what do these graphs actually look like for hot objects? Um, and so here's an example of, uh, this is a real picture of a, a glowing metal ball I, I got from a video on YouTube, a uh, thousand degree metal ball versus milk. And so we might want to know for this object, you know, it looks orange. So is it all orange light or is it a mix of like mostly visible frequencies or actually is it just a little bit of visible light and a bunch of infrared? So next time we're going to uh, do a simulation see what this graph actually looks like for different temperatures as we vary the temperature. And, um, and then finally, um, we're going to uh, 
quantify this thing. So we'll, we'll quantify like what is the peak wavelength? What is the wavelength where the most light is going to be coming out? Um, that depends on the temperature. And we're going to quantify what's the total power of radiation uh, coming from your object. Okay. All right. So that is it for today. And we'll see you next time.